for those who don't know me, my name's Tom O'Meara. I head up the editorial analysis team at Strategy Eye. Uh, we're an intelligence or business intelligence platform with a particular focus on disruptive tech and startups. Obviously, from saying we focus on disruptive tech and startups, Zendesk were on our radar from the early days and from seed funding rounds, etc., which we track. Um, I think we're going to talk a lot about that. We're going to talk about uh, the Zendesk story. We're going to talk about the book as well, because it's actually a book launch here today. Um, I think probably, obviously, this is the star of the show in Mikkel, uh, the author of the book and the co-founder uh, and CEO of Zendesk. I think rather than me giving an introduction to Zendesk, probably the best way to start is if you want to tell us, A, how you had the idea for the company in the first place, and B, where you're at today. Sure. But short. Sure. We can't have a massive selfie <laughs> from the spot. All righty. Thank you. Um, uh, first and foremost, so I live in California now. Um, climate, a little bit different. Um, so I've been coughing for the last couple of days here in Europe. And sorry if my voice is a little uh, rusty, but I hope you can hear me. If not, just shout, and I'll try to do it better. Anyways, um, Sendesk, I am from uh, Denmark originally. Uh, and uh, Sendesk was a... Uh, uh, built out of Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, I have two co-founders, um, and uh, one of them together with me spent a few years in the customer service industry. Um, we were underwhelmed by the quality of the systems uh, in the industry back then, and decided to basically build a tool for what we considered kind of our generation, something that was easy, something that was you know, on demand online, something that <laughs> you know, took away a lot of your problems rather than giving you new problems, and something that really enabled you to engage with your customers. Um, so um, we built Sendesk out of just wanting to build a much better product for providing great customer service. Um, seven years later, uh, we took the company public on the New York Stock Exchange. <clears throat> we are today a company with eight, nine hundred something employees. Uh, we have our headquarters in San Francisco. I've been living there for the last five years. Um, and uh, have 50,000 customers all around the world providing fantastic customer service to, uh, to consumers and businesses all around the world. That was the short version. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think that probably links into the point is customers are at the heart of everything you do. And I think there's an interesting point early in the book where you say you launched the company a lot slower than you wanted due to other um, financial commitments uh, that you had, and you, know, uh, and you were surprised that no larger industry innovation happened in that time. And there's a quote about, that was mainly a testament to the state of the customer support industry. No one was interested in it. It actually made us paranoid because no one cared. And we wondered if we were missing something. Um, why do you think so many businesses pay lip service to customer service, saying customers are the most important thing? and then exhibit behavior that suggests that's anything but true. But I think that was really what we experienced back then, that, that a lot of organizations, especially, and mostly very large enterprises, invested a lot of money in like, these systems that could you know, manage their customer service interactions. But first and foremost, these systems were incredibly expensive. It took forever to implement them. It was typically like 18 months projects to get these things up and running. Um, and you could really feel when you work with the organizations that they were really optimized for what we say is like the institution. It was all about manageability and, and making sure that the customers didn't steal more time than necessary from the company. <coughs> it was, back then, a customer service center was a cost center. You know, it was something that you were obligated to have, and nobody looked at it as, as an opportunity. Nobody th thought about it as an opportunity to create better relationships with their customers and, and a, you know, exploit that relationship and see what, what you could do with that relationship. Did, you know, today things are different, and, and I think we somehow helped change that world. But there's bigger trends going on in the world, like social media, the internet, have changed how we communicate with organizations. And it's a much more public experience today. If you have a bad customer service experience, you're not, you're not, it's, it's, not, it's not happening in a vacuum anymore. It's a very public experience. You're going to tell your friends and family about it. You are going to tell the whole internet about it. And, and, and companies really suffer from that. It hurts their brand when people go out and say that this service that I'm using and this product that I'm using is just terrible, don't go out and buy it. It really influences. It's, it's, the, it's the time of the influencer economy uh, today. Um, so it has become an opportunity nowadays for, customer, for, for organizations to 
uh, build a new type of relationship with their customers that can help them not only provide a great experience, but it can actually help them turn their customers into promoters of their brands. Because the same way you t share bad experiences, you're also sharing good experiences. And if you've had a great product or a great service experience, you are going to share that with your friends and families. And that is, for a lot of businesses, that is the primary customer acquisition driver today. So customer service has really become something that used to be a cost center and now has become like a <coughs> revenue center for organizations and something they have to think about in the context <coughs> of their customer acquisition. Okay. And in terms of your customers yourself, um, I mean, your client list reads like a what's hot list in tech. You have people like, you know, Pinterest, Uber, uh, Airbnb, these kinds of... Are these, uh, A, how did you acquire those customers? And B, are those the ones that you just wheel out for people like me to write about? <laughs> or, or are they actually the most lucrative? Who are your most lucrative customers? We are an organization with 50,000 customers. And that also means that we don't have one single customer that is representing more than, you know, 5% of our revenues. Uh, non, no, and most customers represent much, much less than that. Um, um, but these are some of the interesting names because we all know them and we all know that they are new generation companies. And, and I think uh, startups are companies that think most, that, that think uh, really deeply about how they can change the market dynamics, how they can be disruptive by using new technology, how they can use new technology to grow much faster than their than the incumbents, that the, the companies they are disrupting, and other competitors. And, th and therefore, they're looking at tools like Senders, for example, to change the trajectory of their business. Companies like, you know, we it's funny, like, we've known so many uh, startups from the inside since we moved to uh, San Francisco, and companies like Twitter and Groupon. Like, Groupon, they, it was Andrew Mason himself, the founder of Groupon, who set up, who, who, who configured their Senders over the weekend. Uh, somehow he ended up with the customer service responsibility for that weekend, and he configured Sendesk and said, like, okay, like, we have to use this system going forward because it just makes it so much easier for us. And we followed that growth, and today they have thousands and thousands of people using Sendesk to run their operations all over the world. And we saw that growth from the inside. For Groupon, it was so important to contain <coughs> potential bad experiences. Like, they couldn't risk the exposure of a bad experience uh, spreading uh, to the community. So they, they had to provide a great customer service experience. Um, for a company like Uber, uh, you know, Uber is, has been a fundamental disruptor in, in, in the US, and I, uh, and I know they're changing Europe too. They were so dependent on a viable uh, word of mouth of uh, organic growth. Like you had a great experience with Uber, you told other people about it, and they started using Uber too. To, uh, to ensure that great experience. They had to make sure that if there was the smallest chance of a bad experience, they initially contained it and turned that bad experience around <coughs> to a great experience. But being proactive in the customer service and making sure that any bad experience uh, were redeemed and, uh, and basically helped. And they use Senders for that, and that has been transformative for their business. And I think that's how a lot of, our, of these startups, these new generation companies, that's how they think about customer service, and that's why we have so many of them in our portfolio. So it wasn't so much of a conscious decision to go after them. It's more no. a more productive way you were based. We had 10,000 companies using Senders before, uh, before we started hiring salespeople. <laughs> so we, we build a self-service business where people who come to a website, sign up for Sendesk and start using it. Um, we found out after a while that you know, if we hired salespeople, we could engage much better with a lot of these customers and grow a lot of these customers to much bigger customers. Uh, but initially, it was all self-service. And a lot of these companies, they came to us themselves. Groupon started as you know, free people using a system. And you know, suddenly, they had thousands and thousands of agents all over the world. OK. Um, going back to sort of the early days, or sort of the early days of the company pre-IPO, if we talk about funding, um, in the book, you talk about turning down a VC, an angel investor, early on, because he wasn't a right fit for the company. And you say entering a relationship with a VC is a bit like entering a marriage. Um, what sort of advice would you give um, to startups in today's world on finding the right kind of investor and knowing when to take the investment and when not to? 
Well, it, it's first and foremost like like raising that initial round is a lot of hard work. I don't envy anybody doing that again because it, it, it was so hard for us and we had a terrible time doing it. Um, because like it is really like being rejected all like again and again. Every single week you're just being rejected. <laughs> Until you find somebody, at some point you find that soulmate that believe in you and want to put their money in your company. Um, the thing is that, that the, the primary role of a good investor is to take the company from one stage to the other. And of course, money is an element in that. And especially when you don't have any money <laughs> and you're bootstrapping your organization, like money is, a, is, is high on the list of the needs that you have because you want to pay yourself a salary and you want to feed your children. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, actually, when you, when you have to pick your VC, like you somehow have to remember that it's not about the money. Like, it's a relationship, it's, it's people that you have to work very tightly with for a long time, and they get to know you uh, very uh, profoundly, uh, and you get to know them very profoundly, um, and they have to help you grow your business and make you think bigger and make you, take you, the company, from, to the next level. And of course, money plays a role in all of that, but it's, 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 it's never really about the money, it's about all the other things. So when you raise money, you should never like you should never optimize your round for like valuation. That's the that's the dumbest thing to do because everybody can come in with a high valuation and that will only come and bite you in the ass at a, at a at a later point. You always have to optimize for the relationship because it is really a relationship, um, and figure out like who are the people that we have the best shared values with and that can help us take the company to the next level. And talking about taking from those early days again, uh, there's some interesting tips in the book for any startups um, about deciding on office space and things like that. I gather you don't really like table football or table tennis from some of your tips, or, or graffiti apparently, which was on Facebook's walls in the early days. But um, are there any other sort of unorthodox tips you'd give to startups um, in terms of well, in terms of their business as a whole? <laughs> well, it you know, <laughs> that's a lot, and we did a lot of crazy things in the early days, and and like it's like especially in the early days of comedy, it's all about kicking up dust. You know, figure out what way can we you know kick up dust, get as much exposure as possible, have different stories we can tell in different contexts, because it's all about getting that attention that over time can lead to customer acquisition. Um, but <laughs> you know, we did, when we hired initially in the US, like, we had no idea about what we were doing. <laughs> we had no network, and like Americans, they are really, really good at writing resumes, like really. Um, so we were like, oh my god, every resume we received, we were like, oh my god, like, you know, <laughs> what do we do with this person? Let's give him all our money and run away. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was really complicated, you know. So instead, like, we, we found out over time that we needed to hire a lot more on attitude rather than skills. And hire for the right attitude, especially in a startup, is so important because, you know, there's a lot of yelling and screaming and bad decisions going on all the time. And like finding people who are agile and can live with kind of a little swearing and that a little ambiguity and a little craziness is, is actually more important than the skill set they necessarily bring into the company. And then, you know, hire athletes, you know, people that can do a little bit of everything because you may hire somebody in for a certain role, but that role will change in two months or three months or five months. Um, and so, you know, that, that these are... I, mean, I describe some of these things in the book. I don't, I don't have good, this book is not about giving good like, tips to how to build a startup because I don't believe in that stuff myself. All the tips that I got, I couldn't use that for anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, like, I think you know, the message is that it's a journey building a startup and we all have to find our own path in building a startup. We all have to somehow do it in our unique way. And, and you, you know, you can use my, and you can use Sender's journey, our journey, as inspiration, but it's important that you find your own and define your own journey. <laughs> okay. well, talking about that journey, obviously, then when you went to IPO, again, there were a lot of people telling you not to IPO at that time. Um, it was a particularly IPO-unfriendly climate um, that Zendesk went public in. Do you still think that was the right decision at the time? 
So um, I, I wouldn't say that a lot of people told us not to IPO, but there was a lot of uncertainty in the market. There had been a big uh, correction in the market of the public valuations, and, and of course everybody was a little freaked out about that. And, 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 um, and the craziest thing is that you spend so much time on preparing an IPO, so not going public is, is also it's a big decision because like suddenly you have to postpone like six, 12 months of work and then trying to figure out if you can make it work at a later point. So, so, so it's, a, it's a very, very stressful thing uh, to think about when you suddenly see a correction in the market and you're planning your IPO. And, and for us, it, it definitely it happened like three weeks before we were ready. So we saw this correction in the market and everybody freaked out and said, oh my god, nobody can go public now. But I think when we, when we, after we spend enough time on talking about it and, and you know, thinking about it carefully, I think what we, what we realized was that you, know, you can never optimize for the right time to go public. And if you look at great companies today, you don't think about when they went public and what the price was at that point in time. It is just the beginning of a new journey. Um, and as a public company, you have a lot more, you can do a lot more things and you have a lot more opportunity ahead of you. So I think what we did was, was the right thing for the company to do because it set up, it set up us nicely for the future. Um, and like the exact price point and the exact kind of conditions we went out on are less important. Okay. Um, and talking about that sort of correction in the market, um, you went through struggles in the dot com itself, which you mentioned in the book, um, with early businesses. Obviously, even that IPO at a point when there was a correction in the market as well. Um, I'm going to have to ask you, with all the valuations, and uh, we track all the time, huge amounts of investment carrying on going into digital and TMT as a whole, um, are we in a bubble? Is it going to burst? I think when we, when we think about a bubble, we think about 2000 and 2001 and what, what happened back then. And I think, it's, I think it's important to remember that the conditions back then were very, very different than they are today. Um, but it, it, it's, and there's no doubt that because things are really hard today, that like, there will be pricing corrections. We've seen it in the public markets. I'm pretty sure we're going to see it in the private markets too. Private, private valuations will see a correction too. Um, and um, and we will see more corrections, but it, I don't think the fundamentals are not as they were in 2000 and 2001. So I don't see the I don't see the I don't see the the premise for a big pop. But I will also say that you know the market went bust in 2000 2001 and it changed a lot. But like it quickly came up again, and then we saw a little correction again with the credit crunch in 2007 2008. And the markets came up again. Um, I think that we will always see these corrections, and you shouldn't lose you shouldn't lose faith or you shouldn't lose kind of uh, uh, willingness or passion about doing what you want to do uh, just because there are corrections in the valuations. Okay. So going back to Zendesk itself, um, there's a lot of talk in the book about luck. Um, and uh, how it was luck that this happened or luck that that happened. But there's also a lot of stuff about, you know, that um, we didn't see it only because it was a good idea. After all, anyone can have a good idea. Um, I don't think you consider it just luck that that good idea turned in uh, to a reality or a success story. Do you want to tell us a bit more about what you think were the key ingredients behind uh, the Zendesk success story? Well, <laughs> I think that luck plays a big role in this. Okay. Like, we were, we were very lucky with the timing. Uh, um, like, did, did we foresee that the internet and social media and, and all these things and the rec rec recommendation economy and all these different things would change how companies thought about their customer relationships? I don't think we did. Maybe we had like a gut feeling for it or a sense for it, but like we had it, we did not have it in a business plan, that is for certain. Um, we just wanted to build a better product and we were very, very lucky with the timing. You know, suddenly when we got it out there and people started to using it, started to use it, and, and then we had all these companies in, in Silicon Valley and San Francisco that suddenly adopted Zendesk. And that meant suddenly we were a hot company. And like, uh, we had trouble raising our Series A, but like after our Series A, like the investors were like coming to us. Because suddenly like we were like the, the, the technology that new startups were using. So like timing, we were very lucky with the timing. Um, we were like, very lucky with a lot of the initial customers. I remember, like, for, like an example, like when Groupon 
um, uh, uh, started using senders, we simply could not understand the business model. It made no sense to us. What is this thing like with coupons? <laughs> let's, and, and like they were, oh, do they need help with the config? I, I can't spend time on that stuff, you know. But then we had a support engineer who just like went all in and helped them and made them successful with their configuration, and, and they became a fantastic customer. So, so much luck is involved when you build a company. But I also want to say that think about a, a, a startup's journey as like you're going down, uh, you're going down a street and, and you know, there's a thousand doors, and you know that behind a, one of these doors there's a big bucket of gold or a golden egg or whatever you say. Um, <laughs> and like pure luck is of course to find that door, open it, and then you s discover the goal. Startup goal, startup luck has, is more related to just opening one door after the other and just not stopping at any point because then sooner or later you will be lucky and find that, that golden egg. And finally, the last kind of question from me. Um, I'm guessing as the co-founder and CEO of a billion dollar plus company, you didn't need to write a book um, to earn more money <laughs> or to try and make ends meet anymore. Um, and even if you did, I think statistically you know, you're probably more likely to make money out of a startup these days than you are out of a first attempt at a book. So why did you write the book? Is it a, a simply part m more of the sort of advertising and marketing of Zendesk or was it something more personal? I think that, that uh, you know, one of the things that we tried when, when we built Sendesk was that people like getting advice from other people um, and realizing how little we could use that advice and how wrong people were <laughs> when they tried to give us advice. It's so funny, like, I remember in the early days people talked to us, why are you giving away a free trial of your software? That, that doesn't make any sense, you know? <laughs> who, would, who would sign up for a free trial of software and try and using it? Like, and now that's how it, like, most software businesses out there are built. But you, we got advice like that. We got a lot of crazy advice. And a lot of people had opinions about how we should build this business. Um, so I think we kind of realized that there are, you know, you can't really, like, there's a lot of bullshit out there. And, and like most books that you buy are, are full of these pretentious kind of, this is how I did it, and this is how you should do it to succeed. That's also why this book doesn't have a lot of you know, tips in it, like it, it's, but it tells our story and I hope that story can be some inspiration. Also because we are very honest about how absolutely little we knew about anything. <laughs> but despite all of that, you know, we, we made it through. And I think especially for those of you who are, who are founders here today and entrepreneurs, like the early days of having a few people working together on a product, it's like, it's almost impossible. Like, there are, there's so, it's so hard to keep people together when there's no money and complete uncertainty about the future. And like, getting through that is, is really, really a tough period. And, and so few of us actually come, come through that, come through that initial phase. And being honest about that, it is really, really hard and you have to work on it almost like a relationship to, <laughs> to succeed through that period. I think it's important for people to remember. So I think some of it is, you know, we want to we wanna tell, tell a story that we hope is useful for other founders. Part of it is also like we are a big public company now and you know, having that connection with our values and our origins and so on, I think it be you know, inspiring and, and, and helpful for you know, our stakeholders, whether that be employees or investors or our customers. Um, and, and maybe it's also a little personal for me. It's just a good way of thinking about, thinking about that period and, and you know, getting my version of the story out there. Because there's probably many different versions of that story, but now you've got mine. <laughs> <laughs>